Yay. Yay! What is up, everyone? Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode 318. We are officially, we're old. Yeah, we're old. We're very much old now. <laughs> uh, we started this when we were 12, um, and we're almost 40. So it's been a long time. Uh, can you can you think back to those days of doing Ginger Runner Live when we were 12? <laughs> the internet. Ah, uh, the internet. Uh, but welcome, everyone, to Ginger Runner Live 318. Our guest tonight, David Roach, he is back for another Ask Coach Roach, one of our favorite shows mm-hmm. to do here. This is uh, number five, Ask Coach Roach, number five, because uh, he's jumped on a number of times on the show. But uh, these are always great, because if you have running-related questions, training-related questions, life-related questions, or just questions about... I don't know, dogs, food. And it's really great to have David back. It's just good to know that like he hasn't blocked our text messages yet. (laughs) (laughs) Yet. 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 Uh, But (laughs) welcome everyone to the show. Sit back, relax. Ginger Runner Live begins now. Ginger Runner. Yay! Yay! What is up, everybody? <laughs> I don't know. I got really into that one. It was a little really aggressive. Tri- it was pretty aggressive. Welcome, everyone, to Ginger Runner Live, number 318. Uh-huh. Thank you for taking some time out of your busy Mondays to spend a little bit of it with us. We very much appreciate having you here during the live show tonight. Uh, our guest, David Roach, is back on the show. He's going to uh, do the show. Uh, let's see. He's going to do the show that we like to do with him <laughs> called Ask Coach Roach. Does that make sense? Not quite. Yeah, I mean, we don't know if he likes to do the show Exactly. That, I that we like the show. I threw too, many, too much <laughs> assumption there. But uh, we've been doing this series called Ask Coach Roach, where we bring in our favorite coach, David Roach, to talk on the show and answer all of your questions about training, running, life, food, love, whatever. And uh, I feel like every time we have him on, we always think this is going to be a great show. And it turns out to be a very great show. There's always words of wisdom and, and inspirational uh, mantras and things that we pull away from these episodes that are honestly kind of crucially important right now. Mm-hmm. And it's just great to have him back. Why? Is something happening right now? Just is some there, things. Is there anything going on? Just some global oh. things. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Um, so before we introduce David, of course, it's uh, it's not just myself. There's also the wonderful Kim. What's up, everyone? Kim Tashima Newberry here, as always. If you're new, welcome. Hello. Thanks for joining us. Um, If you are new here, we are live. We'll be bringing David on in just a second. Um, But because we are live, you can ask David questions. So if you have questions for Coach David Roach, ask him in the chat room. Um, Can be about literally anything. Yeah. Uh, These always turn out to be great episodes because we... Is time real? (laughs) Which is what we asked on the Daily Brew the other day. Um, Because apparently my brain was telling me the time is not real. Regardless, uh, we'll, we'll introduce David here in just a second. So get your questions brewing and drop them into the chat room. Kim will pull them aside and we'll ask David uh, as many questions as we can get through today. Before we introduce him, of course, we have some individuals we like to thank at the top of the show. That is our Patreon crew. It is because of them that we're able to do Ginger Runner Live, able to do our reviews, movies, films, all that stuff. Uh, big shout out to all of our GR crew supporters over at patreon.com slash the ginger runner. For as little as a dollar a month, you get access to like our after shows and stuff. $3 and above per month, you get our daily live stream called Daily Brew. Uh, as I just mentioned, we've been talking about all sorts of subjects. And uh, the most recent episode, I talked about time. Is it real? Uh, I think the title of our last Daily Brew was $170 shoes, comma, time. Is it real? <laughs> Trust me, it's worth it. So if you have not jumped onto our pay, uh, Patreon page, just consider it. Uh, it really does help us out because it is, that's it. That's what we, that's how we... Pay rent. You can also see other classics like bagged milk, ketchup chips. Don't give them don't give them too much. <laughs> Before you know it, we're gonna have way too many people watching these shows, and then it's just gonna be part oh, of like man. pop culture zeitgeist and then <laughs> conversations. There's over a hundred episodes of that that you can go back and watch. It's it's like better than Netflix. <laughs> Purely better than Netflix. Uh, two individuals in particular at the top tier Patreon we like to shout out at the beginning of every Ginger Runner Live episode. They've really gone above and beyond and they help us out in big, big, big ways. Chris Lee out of Hong Kong, he's a wonderful human, uh, has an organization called Trailblazer that showcases the trails in that region. Uh, and Brian Sands, who's been a longtime supporter and has an inspirational story himself, uh, mm-hmm. ran his first marathon, first 50K at the age of 50, and is still training, still training for big, 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 big projects. He's just a wonderful, wonderful person. So shout out to those two individuals for helping uh, so much in making Ginger Runner and Ginger Runner Live a thing. Mm-hmm. Without further ado, I would like to welcome back to the show for the 547th time. Um, I feel like that's 
certainly that's not accurate. But every time we have him on, we just we just love having him on the show because it's just consistent love, uh, happiness, inspiration. I don't know how he manages to do it, but but he does. So without further ado, welcome to the show. David Roach. Yay! <laughs> so much for having me. I was thinking back to when we first did this when we were all 12, and it was really meaningful, you know? Like, I think we really got through those middle school years together. Uh, <laughs> those are the no, hardest I, years. I do love being on here so much, and Addie loves it most of all because I was thinking <laughs> she gets, like, a full spa massage the entire time. So um, she is pretty <laughs> obsessed. Though I did just notice that she has some gray hairs in her snoot now. So. Aww into the whole time discussion. <laughs> oh, she, she looks like she's time traveling right now. Those eyes being pulled back. She's in the vortex. Like, I'm aware of my death. <laughs> oh. uh, so it's not just David Roach. It is also Addy. Oh, Addy Dog, when dogs just... get the little like frosty faces, we're seeing it with yeah. Gus too, but I'm denying that it's happening. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, they compress they compress life down into like a really discreet section. And, you know, we've never, we never had a dog get through the aging process. And so it's super interesting and also sad, but also in exciting. It's all those different things at once. And, um, she just, she just gets better with love at age. So maybe that's what we can all do. Uh, I think I mean we've got so much to talk about. I feel like every show that we bring David on, there's never a shortage of things to cover and, and topics to kind of dive into. Um, two things before we get into Ask Coach Roach stuff. One, congratulations on your FKT. I know that you purposefully don't want to talk about this. All I want to do is congratulate you because it was a pretty hearty FKT. But I do want to find out uh, some stats on the route. Can you let people know? And if you have Giardia. <laughs> and if you have Giardia. But like, well, what was the I, distance? What is it, the route that you I took? The I don't have the best stomach in general. So if I got Giardia, it would probably just fight against whatever other bacteria <laughs> are in my stomach, and then they would just cancel each other out. So, oh, cancel. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so the route is Pawnee Buchanan Loop uh, here outside Boulder in the mountains. So it's kind of like the – it's been like the route that a lot of Boulder runners over the years have tested themselves on. So there were 19 billion rocks – and um, over like 26 miles with 7,000 feet of climbing. Um, so super, like it's the most stunning course you could ever see. And cool. um, my ankles are not thanking me today, but it was really fun. And um, yeah, I'm really excited for like an athlete we coached. You know, like I'm already like, okay, now we need to send athletes we coach out there because I should not be holding this FKT too long. Uh, just a testament to David's character. I believe after he set the FKT, he was already talking about being excited for one of his athletes to go out and reset the FKT. So oh it was God. like, hey, this is really cool, but man, wait till someone else it's does you, better. It's right? It's me. I can't wait. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's Gus. Gus. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Gray hairs in the snoop, but Giardia doesn't get dogs, so he's going to be ready. Uh, the rumor was that you tried or attempted it but got off course early like on another day and then you came back and then you tried it again and, and what yeah. sort of happened? So on Thursday of last week, it's one of those things you have to wake up really early to get to because it gets up to close to 13,000 feet. And so I went up there super early, was really feeling myself at like mile five or six. Um, and there's only about a hundred meters of Jeep road on this whole thing. And I just was on that Jeep road and I was just like, ah, this is nice. And I just kept going as opposed to turning off on the little side trail. <laughs> um, and then I, I got I got like eight minutes down that road, and I'm like, this feels like it might not be the right decision. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I turned around. I mean, it ended up being a pretty long day because I got, I got out there a little bit. But, um, you know, Megan, my wife being the best coach and supporter, she's just like, well, just recover as long as you need to and then go do it again. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was it was one of those moments where it's like, a really helpful reminder not to take yourself too seriously, uh, which yeah. was nice going, nice going into the longer effort because as much as I coach the really long stuff, I don't do too much of that personally. Um, so, you know, it's really stepping into my lack of comfort zone, which is like these big mountain burly routes that are more like the types of people that are mountaineer types. Whereas me, I, I like the California trails a little bit. I, I think that's <clears throat> something, there's something to be said about that because, uh, it's cool to see you step out of your comfort zone as a coach. You coach so many different people and you you really do encourage us to take our shot and to to push our boundaries. So it's really neat to see you do that. And, and 
the summer of FKTs is here. And uh, it's really honestly been a blast to kind of follow along with people exploring themselves and new trails and and seeing what they're capable of outside of a race environment. Uh, I've always loved it. I've always loved kind of stepping outside of the race environment and, you know, doing an adventure without a bib. So it's cool to see yeah, people like you and, and other athletes do that. Maybe the the thing that for everyone else that might be relevant, as opposed to like my whatever, my little jog was, um, so 10 years ago, I remember when I was first starting to like get into running a little bit more seriously and understand what, what it entailed in the whole world. I would read Anton Kropichka's blog, like religiously, every update he read, I would, re- I would, or he posted, I would read. And, um, I remember him writing about this route in 2010 and, you know, everything about it. And I, I remember thinking, wow, it's just so crazy that anyone can do that and being like, well, maybe one day in the future, I'll be able to do that in like daylight, let alone, you know, run, run it like in seriously. And, um, you know, it just, it, it's a sign of like, you know, reflecting on all those 10 years and being like, well, if I'm going to say I'm proud of myself for something, it's not like running it fast. It's just not giving up on myself in that time, you know, yeah. where, when that seemed impossible. So like, I think the message that I want to send to athletes is more like not, not to run a route fast, like go for an FKT necessarily, but to, to think about whatever that scary thing is that seems like it's something that someone else does, you know, that's not your thing. And be like, you know, maybe what if, what if I give myself the chance to think it's possible? Mm. I love that. I think that's yeah. <clears throat> I, I I believe that, and I I want to live that, and uh, mm-hmm. I think it's just great advice for everybody. Um, and also, just briefly, bef- uh, we're already getting questions for David, which is fantastic. So if you have uh, coaching related questions, training questions, anything, ask him. And the also, chat the chat room is moving pretty quickly, so feel free to re ask your question if you don't hear it being asked. I just want to take a moment to recognize that you and your wife, Megan, uh, are doing a really cool podcast and we don't have to talk long about it because I know you very, uh, uh, da- this is just something that's actually really great about David is that he doesn't like talking often about their own accomplishments. We were talking about having David on the show and we're like, I was like, yeah, that's awesome. We can talk about his FKT and their new podcast. And then you immediately were like, I don't think they're going to want to talk Dude. about that, <laughs> but I would be remiss if I didn't mention it. You guys have a fantastic podcast. That is in bite-sized chunks, 30-ish minutes per episode. You and Megan just cover so many different topics in such a great way. Why did you start it? Like, where was the inspiration behind it? And also, uh, does it excite you? Is it a cool sort of new avenue that you guys are exploring? So a husband and wife doing a podcast, joking around with each other in like a really informal way. I wonder where we got our inspiration from. <laughs> but no, I mean, We're not coaches. We don't know the stuff that you guys know. <laughs> oh, it's, I mean, no, it's different. But at the same time, like, you know, we, when we've been on Ginger Runner Live and seeing the way you guys interact and then the way we were out to interact and then the community was just like, you know, well, at some point, are you guys ever thinking about doing that? We were asked that question when we were first on. Um, so it planted a seed and, um, you know, our idea is like, we love sitting around and talking over beer, like, like you guys do. And that's kind of what we want our podcast to be is like bite-sized 30 minute things where we can just, you know, as Megan would say, well, I don't want to use a cuss word, but, um, we're, we're going to need an explicit mark on the podcast, but yeah. So essentially it's just an excuse to, you know, Megan's the most brilliant person I know, and we get to talk and be super present with each other for 30 minutes. So some more yeah. golf play podcast, if you're interested, we're not looking to make it into anything like I'm breaking my own rule about what you can accomplish in 10 years. We're not looking to make it into anything like spectacular or anything. It's more just, um, you know, a chance to talk about really tough subjects and less tough subjects, like everything from, you know, sex and, and really complex topics like that to strides and running related things. So, um, yeah, it'll either... It'll either be interesting or like a delightful story to tell to our kids about some some experiment that failed. <laughs> uh, just going off the comments in the chat, please don't stop doing it because people are <laughs> clearly in love with the podcast. Yeah. We are as well. And there is like this is something that I think we discovered with YouTube and the platform so many years ago is that there is endless room for people to come and have their discussions and do their content and, and make what they want to make. There is endless room. Uh, the only thing that I, I like the rule of thumb that we abide by is support others, lift others up and, and showcase other people's work. Cause it's the, it's the only way that everything gets better. So oh, please keep doing it. 
I think that applies to everything. Like, you know, for anyone in your own life, the, the zero sum game that all of our brains want to play where it's like anyone else's success is my failure or whatever, um, is so counterproductive for, you know, yourself, not just the other people. Like, I mean, in coaching is a great example of that. Like when you think about running coaching, like there's a certain number of athletes to go around right this second. And I think that there's a tendency for people to be like, Oh, well, you know, I need to, like, if someone, if another coach is succeeding, that's not great. Or I need to like go for it and t- say why these coaches are bad or whatever. When in reality, like if we left everyone up, there's going to be like 10 million more athletes in five years that want yeah. coaches. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think all oh, that's, I mean, I think it applies to everything. Like if, if you can apply that to your job or social media or whatever, it's just seeing someone else's do something and be like, Oh, I want that to be great. And I want them to love that. It, like just makes the, it makes it better for everyone. It, it, there's just, there's no shortage of room. And I, I love it. I can't wait mm-hmm. to, for each new episode and people in the chat are like, I'm saving the episode for tomorrow's long run or, you know, that sort of thing. Like people love hearing your two voices and your, your both your voices are so, uh, well, one, they're easy to listen to. Let's be honest there. Um, <laughs> but the, the dynamic that you two have with each other, I think is unique and it's, Fantastic. Well, people, we love it. I'll let people compliment my dulcet tones all day long. But, <laughs> you know, it, it's interesting because, like, you know, as a coach, I think, like, you know, I played some role in your guys' journey. And then when we're starting this new journey, which is a totally different creative thing where we're like, you know, we don't know how much we have to learn. It's like we look to you and all the mentorship you've given us. And it's just a sign of, like, you know, we all have our things, whatever those are, and we can all move into them. Like, we're never, you know, we're not the best in the world at this, but we're going to get better and we're going to watch you guys do it. And it's just super cool to think about how, you know, it's this whole community thing of people learning new skills and trying things and shooting shots um, and all that. So I, I'm really, I get so excited to record it each week because I just love learning from Megan. And then um, also it's nice to have a hard 30 minute cap because yeah. I don't ramble on too long about random things. Uh, it's, it is a learning process. It took us 318 episodes to figure out. Well, you guys have we been doing it since we're 12. So I'm going <laughs> to We don't that. still don't know really what we're doing every episode, though. <laughs> uh, that's kind of the beauty of it is, is, I don't know. I look forward to it every time that you guys put on a new episode. So if you still are getting excited about it, we're going to be flipping out about it. Well, so yeah. To, to tease the next one that we're going to record tomorrow, someone asked a question that was just, um, I'm not sure if Megan's going to approve this, so she hasn't seen the script <laughs> yet. Someone asked a question that was just booze, discuss. Um, so I don't know. Why exactly. don't you? I am so you? sorry. I, that was a joke. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure if that'll make it in, but if it does, I will, it'll be interesting. We'll see. Who cares? Yeah. Do you guys sit down with the topics ahead of time, or is it kind of the surprise thing where, like, I've yeah, got yeah. a couple Yeah. We like make sure we do a little bit of research. I mean, Megan wants to go in like heavily prepared with studies and things like that. Um, and you know, I'm more of the the comic relief <laughs> element like, that's more comfortable. <laughs> you know, not being a doctor, not being a PhD, like I can I can take up the rear and you know make jokes about rears and things. <laughs> so I think the first question we have here is just boobs? Question um, mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Discuss. And it's Megan <laughs> in the chat. It's room. weird. It's Megan. I don't. I don't know. It's, we figured we'd talk about it. Um, it's a great podcast. Everyone who's watching here, go listen to it. Uh, it's great. Follow along because there'll be new episodes and stuff like that. Um, this is an Ask Coach Roach episode. <laughs> we promised that we would be asking David Roach your questions. It is time to start diving in. So if you have any training, running, life, love, <laughs> boob related questions, uh, feel free to ask them in the chat. Kim, what do we got for David? Uh, I'm going to start with this one because we talked about this a little bit in my running log, um, kind of related. Miranda Jacobson in the chat room says, David, curious if if you have any training tips for someone with both a sprained ankle and a wrist. I'm looking more for a way to keep my sanity versus becoming overly concerned about losing fitness. Well, that's an amazing, I mean, this is the the time of year of sprained ankles in particular, right? Um, (laughs) you know, I was reflecting to Kim, like both of my ankles right now, if, if this, if this camera went down, look like nasty softballs, like, um, you know, <laughs> nasty just, softballs, nasty, not even the good type. I'm talking about, like, <laughs> you know, the type, they played the whole game with it as scuffs. It's just nasty. Ball um, jokes, ball jokes, ball jokes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, we have a theme going right now, uh, but yeah. So basically the idea with 
sprained ankles is that they really come on a spectrum. And um, in fact, there's a GR crew member, I don't want to tell her story, but um, so she had a sprained ankle on a trail run recently, um, a few weeks ago. And, you know, it's like, sky is falling. Like you go to a doctor for one of those sprained ankles and often they'll be like, well, that looks like a six week sprained ankle. But every trail runner knows there are those types of sprains, but it's not that common. Um, if an ankle can bear weight, especially right after injury, um, it'll most likely be okay pretty quickly. Um, but you can't baby it too much. You want to keep moving. So to get at the cross training question, this is where biking really comes in handy. You don't want to be out of the saddle or anything like that. But what, what we recommend is one, listen to your doctor, because I don't have good enough insurance to, to justify <laughs> um, giving medical advice. But two is to wrap it loosely, like with an ace bandage or something like that. And not to be afraid to sweat. So biking is the place to start. And what you might notice is that the swelling and discoloration will go way down after your first session. Mm -hmm. um, and you can go from there, from biking to hiking. Um, and then even right after that, you can usually get into very easy running. But my general <laughs> suggestion would be to start with cycling because if it can handle that, it'll probably even accelerate the recovery process for the kind of middle ground sprained ankles. Like every trail runner needs to account for, I'm going to have you know, a few three to six days sprained ankles every, every summer. Um, and it's not, it's just a question of like how you deal with that process. Great. I would say, uh, they also mentioned having an, um, a broken wrist or a wrist sprained strain, wrist. A sprained wrist. So oh, just don't use your arms. <laughs> <laughs> don't do this. There's, don't do this. There's, a, there's a T-Rex on our, on our, uh, so you, just, you just got arms, whatever. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to downplay your, the wrist injury, but don't mess with that because you know you have risk of things like carpal tunnel and, and other long-term issues. Like right now, while I'm doing that, I feel pain in my wrist from previous broken wrists that I didn't really fully let heal. So um, you know, hopefully your activities don't use your arms. Biking good because if you're especially on a stationary, you can prop your arm up or do something like that. Um, and one option later on when the wrist is healed, but you're not good for rotation, um, is to, you can do push ups on your closed fists, things like that. Um, so just try not to do anything that tenses that wrist because there are risks of like doing what I did to it and causing yourself to be a, you know, sad little T-Rex. <laughs> uh, I know that I like on my bike trainer, there are like, I have a touring elbow pads that you can like basically lay your forearms into. So if you're worried about wrist stuff, it's easy. <laughs> And I'm, I'm realizing I'm like locked in here. My wrist is You just... look just like David's shirt. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Next question for David. A uh, question from Christopher. Christopher says, David, I really struggle in ultra marathons with long, flat sections, but I'm fine with power hiking and running downhill mostly. What should I do to fix this? Well, that's an amazing question. I think it really gets back to the importance of running economy in trail running. So, you know, even if you think that the uphill, your hiking and your downhill running are optimized, if the flat running is difficult, there's a chance that there's massive room for improvement in all of those things too. There may be this latent talent that hasn't been fully recognized yet that can really be developed. Um, so the way we like to do it is have athletes, even ones that are really focused on trails, split their time between like technical mountain style running and normal running where you might be running on flatter surfaces doing things like speed work and strides and things like that. So let's just say a template week with an athlete that runs five or six times a week. A Monday is a rest day, Tuesday, Wednesday, two days where you focus on flatter or rolling style running where you're not gonna have to hike too much, um, though you can do that too. Um, that'll really start to build your running economy, making flat running take a little bit less energy. And then on Thursday, Friday, or Thursday, Saturday, Sunday, you can do more trail style runs where you have a lot of joy in the mountains or wherever you do your trail runs. Mm -hmm. And then Friday be a flex day where you run flat, cross train, something. <laughs> um, so splitting half and half in the summer months can really let you develop the ability to run flats, which then will also translate directly to your climbing ability, which is the coolest thing about, about this process is that um, all the studies show that flat ground running economy and uphill running con economy are directly correlated. So if you're able to improve the flat ground running economy, which we know can improve for decades, then your uphill climbing will also improve in a way that Climbing does not work the other direction. It doesn't necessarily improve your flat ground running past a certain point. That's awesome. That's awesome. Super insightful. Mm. And I, ho uh, I ho assume very helpful too. Great question. Yeah. <laughs> He's in the chat room. He's just like, 
bullshit. <laughs> no, whatever. <laughs> That's not it. <laughs> no, but, I mean, it's something that we've talked about here on the show before. It is something that you've coached me to in the past where, you know, I'm asking, do I need to be doing my repeats on hills or on flats or that sort of thing? And, and you incorporate both into training, but you have encouraged me like running economy on flat does translate to hills and to climbing and all that. Like the connection has proved itself to me based off of, of training and, and, and things that you've done with me and my workouts and stuff. It's been kind of fascinating to follow along with that because well, it's I mean, counterintuitive too, yeah, to my, so, what my brain would imagine. If someone just gets a little bit more comfortable running like on flat ground, they'll, you, it's like exponential levels of improvement when you start going uphill. It's crazy. I mean, you can see it at the very top level with you know, the mountain running championships like the US and, and world, like Grayson Murphy sure. being a great example. Grayson came from track comes to trails and immediately wins the world championships, despite almost no specific training, just a, a couple months. Um, and it's just a sign that it is speed at the end of the day. And, um, but it, it applies even more for people that might be like middle of the pack or back of the pack, because every single little gain you can make on ups is a much higher percentage of the total time you're doing something. Mm. And it can make running way more fun too, because um, you know you, you just look forward to every different portion of, of the you know, the time you're out there. Sweet. That being said, I think it is important to note that uphill, uphills always kind of suck. Like, I, I think sometimes <laughs> there's an illusion that some, some like pro loves running uphill and maybe there are some, some freaks out there that do. But um, I think it's important to reflect that like uphills aren't necessarily about, you know, loving every second. It's kind of like a metaphor for life. Uphills are the, you know, the vegetables before your pizza. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> you know, I, I enjoy uphills, but I also I enjoy climbing because I feel like it's more of an equalizer for me. Yeah. Like if I'm with you or some of our faster friends, I don't mind doing the uphills because I feel like I can keep up better on the uphills versus yeah. like on the flat section. Because every you, you know everyone power pass you all on the downhill. Yeah, on the downhill, <laughs> yeah, you do. But you know everyone's power hiking in some degree. It like this is my opinion, but I would say that the differences in people's power hike is smaller than the differences in like people's flat surface speed, for example. So if you have a, a Grayson Murphy versus uh, a me or a Kim on a flat surface, we're going to get our ass kicked every day of the week. But on a power hike, like not a running uphill, but maybe like a power hike grind, I might be able to hold pretty well. My heart rate is going to be through the roof, but like I'll be able to grind out a power hike <clears throat> at a fairly similar speed David's laughing at you I realize I'm David's like it's laughing at you I'm saying this one, <laughs> oh she'd definitely still kick my ass no this is this is a uh a, it's a smile of acknowledgement of <laughs> a brilliant a brilliant point actually totally a little bit tangential but did remind me of one thing that was a little funny that happened on the FKT thing um so there's you know to end it really it has this one massive climb up to 13,000 feet super alpine and, and tough to root find and things like that and so I'm just like trying to, I'm not a great hiker, but I'm kind of hike scrambling up the side of this, this thing. And then all of a sudden in the distance, I hear David Roach. <laughs> uh, I look over and there's a woman who might be in the chat room. That's kind of what I'm saying. It's like a misconnection. Um, it's like, where are you going? Um, so I was just like fully off trail going into like the hinterlands. I was going to go like make friends with mountain goats and become their king. I don't know what I was doing. <laughs> Um, but fortunately, I was able to get back, you know, like scramble to the side and get back on trail before I uh, had my, you know, you had been reading out, reading about me in the news or something. That was the spirit of the mountain. Uh, <laughs> you met her and she I'm glad she kept you on trail. So you weren't just, out in the hinterland. I love you so much. <laughs> <laughs> David. I like her that her voice is also David Roach. <laughs> It's, it's like a ghost the, of. <laughs> I am the ghost of your past. There was no Ten Strava feet to the left. Like, I like Strava flybys because I was like, this is going to be my best friend forever. And there wasn't. So uh, if you're out there, thank you. And you're loved. <laughs> Nobody's responding. In the yeah, chat room. no, I, I definitely don't think this person exists. I think it was a figment or uh, a visitation. Uh, that's amazing. <clears throat> well, way to experience like, that. Be, like someone needs to tell him. Yeah. <laughs> Vivian says it was Mother Earth. <laughs> oh, there yeah. she was. She was out there. Uh, um, keep going, sorry. Question from Marie Claude in the chat room. Marie Claude says, question for Coach Roach. I do my regular training interval and cannot get my heart rate to reach the targeted level, even if I increase speed. What can I do to get a higher heart rate? Super interesting. So I think when you're thinking about heart rate, the first thing is 
high individual variance. So it really depends on how you set your heart rate zones. If you're using a general formula, it, it's most likely useless and you can throw it out. Um, like if you're saying 180 minus age or anything like that, because people have wildly varying physiologies that's not dependent on fitness, it's just dependent on genetics. Like I've seen, um, you know, pro athletes that run 175 heart rate on their easy runs, like because their lactate threshold, their aerobic thresholds are just so naturally set high. And then others that are like 135 doing the same effort, but those athletes are the same in races. Um, mm -hmm. Number two is if you're, it depends how you're measuring too. Um, wrist-based wrist sensors on running are still, you know, all the studies that come out say moderately useless. Um, there are some that can be accurate for individual athletes, but across the population, they're, they're really not that, not that useful. So unless you're doing interval workouts and seeing like the spikes you would expect and everything else doesn't have dropouts or any of the other weird things, that's, that might not be that useful. Um, and then the final one is just a really, um, it's all about effort. So the heart rate is a proxy for that, but unless you have some anomalous physiology, whatever you're getting your heart rate to when you increase the speed is most likely the general effort zone that matters. So for some athletes, that will be lower, and it doesn't really matter that much. Um, and yeah, so in other words, to give, your, give yourself leeway for where that is. So instead of saying, I need to get my heart rate to here based on some external thing, even an external test, look at that workout you did and be like, where did you get your heart rate to? Okay, that's a good number to think about in the future for similar types of workouts. Um, that's why to only set heart rate zone based on field tests. Like the best one to do if you're, if you're watching and you want like a little tip is the frill method, which is what we all have our athletes do when we do use heart rate monitors, which isn't too common, but it does happen sometimes, which is a 30 minute time trial with a ideally chest strap heart rate monitor. Um, and you take your average heart rate for the last 20 minutes of that. Um, and then you assume that that's your lactate threshold heart rate. And from that number, you can set every zone from your easy runs, which will be 80 to 85% of that number usually, um, to like intervals and things like that. But the main place it's useful is on easy runs. So mm -hmm. that was a big spiel, but basically don't be, don't be um, beholden to a number about your heart rate because that, that incorporates way more variables than, like, uh, than might be necessary. What is much more helpful often is perceived exertion. Like if you feel like you're going fast, if you feel like you're going harder, that's a good place to start. It's funny that you mentioned the like 180 minus age. I feel like that was the first thing I learned when like when running and wanted to deal with heart rate. That was it. And this was like 10 yeah. years ago. They were just mm -hmm. like, go to 180 minus your age, variance of five or so BPMs. Uh, but that's the perfect number for you to sort of figure out your like easy pace. And I was like, oh, that's so easy. But I think you quickly learned that that doesn't always mean that your body is exerting the right amount of like I for me, that would have been like somewhere like run 150 when I learned about this. Right. And that always felt like it was just too high. It almost felt like yeah. a race effort every time I would try to hit 150. And it's just because maybe that is a race. effort. And then there's other people that are listening that are probably like, wait, what? Even It feels the opposite to me. It feels way too, easy. you know, like I want to be, a, I want to be much higher. Um, so I think it's really important for everyone to calibrate what their easy is individually. Um, and know that like, while there is like a general center of the bell curve, Statistically, like most, uh, many of us will be outside of like the first standard deviation, mm. and so I'm right. I'm right in the middle of the bell curve. Megan is way more like you, Ethan, where she would have to run too fast to hit those numbers, yeah. um, and so to be flexible with where you fall. Got it. Uh, go for it. <clears throat> Uh, question from Chad. Chad says, can you run maintenance runs or long runs too slow? If so, how do you know what is what too slow is? There is no such thing as too slow running for just general base mileage or easy miles. Like, um, I think that's really one of the hardest things for athletes to realize is that um, you're getting very few adaptations that, that are fundamentally important from pushing those days that don't have like more of a specific purpose. Um, so you can think about the adaptations that are actually happening with easy running. The main thing we're thinking about is aerobic development. And that requires, you know, the more oxygenation, the better. Um, you know, when you're thinking about angiogenesis, which is uh, expansion of capillaries and things like that, all these different things really combine to mean that going easier is probably, erring on the side of easier is probably better than erring on the side of even a second too fast. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, that's the main thing we try to focus on with athletes is like, you know, I don't care if you're running two and a half times your marathon pace on your easy days sometimes, as long as you do a little bit more work uh, other times. So for everyone listening, have, have 
the patience with yourself to slow down and shut this it's like it's totally fine in fact i would say that for most athletes like if that purchase consistency it's like the most of that's so that's interesting because i would have thought we've talked about keeping your easy runs easy on the show with you before and it's something that you've coached me before on and kim on uh many many times but it's like every time I do those easy efforts, it feels like I'm doing it wrong. You know, if Kim and I go out for a run together and we just want to kind of casually hike for a couple miles and on the ups and then maybe kind of jog the downs, we'll get back to the car. And I'm like, yeah, that was a, that was a great run, but we didn't really go very far. Maybe we're out there for a couple hours or something. We only logged a couple miles and it's always, it's still to this day, difficult for me to go. Doesn't matter. Like easy effort for base miles. Don't worry about the pace. Don't worry about the pace. And it comes ultimately comes always comes back to what are other people going to think when they see this on Strava? And like, are people going to judge me based off my speed or my, are they going to think I'm getting slower with age and things like that? It's never really been about what I think it's been about what other people think. So it's, that's, that's a note for me, but it's funny that you say, I'm so glad you said that again, because it sort of brings up that conversation. Like if we can emphasize that again, yes. Yeah, I mean, the body responds to build up stresses, not break down stresses. Um, break down stresses have places in extreme moderation. Um, but when you're thinking about build up stresses, like you need to feel good. Like if you're not feeling good, th- that's a proxy for a bunch of different variables that will probably lead to less adaptation over time and especially less long term growth. Um, so, you know, when you zoom out and see this over like over long term processes, I mean, one of my biggest red flags, like at, especially even for pro athletes is like, oh, that person is doing their easy runs too fast. I'm like, that mm-hmm. might work if they're 22. Um, but, you know, even at 26, it stops working. And often those 26-year-olds are like, well, this worked for me at 22. Um, and then everyone else is kind of experiencing the same principle. It's like, well, this worked for me when I started running. Why isn't it working for me now? Um, and the answer is like, well, when you start, I mean, just, just throwing anything at the wall, it will all stick. Um, later on, like, you need to truly develop a, a base and we're talking physiological things here not not psychological things and that requires you know really getting comfortable just putting in like lots of easy as much easy volume as you can yeah uh and inga brings up a great point that uh david on this show has used this quote in the past before but uh to quote david if your easy run pace on strava impresses anyone you're doing it wrong and uh yeah, i think that's something you said run. for a while yeah it's not an easy run and i i think that's not to say that it's a bad thing. It just has a different training purpose, right? So like when you're thinking about long runs, like I wrote an article the other week on long run intensity. I'm a huge proponent of having intensity in long runs. But if that's not the goal, then as slow as you want to go. Like it, there's nothing that can um, really can be too slow. I mean, almost no one could run slow enough. Like even a pro athlete running 15 minutes per mile, like I'd be totally fine with that um, as long as they're put in the work the other time. And I think, I think that's the key, right, is for, for someone like me who's average, middle-of-the-pack runner, easy runs, doesn't matter how easy you go, as long as you're doing it, you know, keeping it easy, uh, as long as you balance that. Like, I worry about, am I going to lose my speed? Am I going to, anything that I have, am I going to lose that? But it's incorporating those key workouts on the days that actually matter, right? Is that what's yeah, keeping yeah. When, that around? You know, when it's time, the body will have it. And that's the craziest thing about running is, like, <laughs> if you my arm hair in, keeps rubbing up against Kim and she keeps like yeah, yeah, yeah. thinking it's a spider it's not shocks. it's my arm hair <laughs> yeah it's just like constant electric shocks from your arm hair <laughs> that's love David that's how love works yeah 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 if there aren't sparks from arm hair what <laughs> um, but yeah I mean the, the, the weird thing about running is that sh- it's not about showing fitness it's about building fitness right and the more you show fitness the less you're building usually so like a good example is this effort I did this weekend, like it is going to fundamentally decrease my fitness temporarily. It might lead to a little bit more musculoskeletal resilience to be able to handle other efforts in the future. But the specific type of aerobic effort followed by the downtime and with the taper and all that, it's not actually going to help me that that much. And so, mm. I, you know, when you're thinking about training, like it's that in a nutshell, you don't want to anything that tears your body down. Is, is not necessarily good for growth. This isn't weightlifting where you're like, I need to get hypertrophy in my muscles and that requires, this is aerobic development. And aerobic development happens in um, cellular level contexts that don't have these breakdown stresses. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll probably aerobically regress a little bit from this past weekend. Whereas like someone doing just purely easy runs 
will have that benefit that then they can use it to layer into other things. So it truly means a base. It lifts everything up so that when you're on top of that, you know, you can put in the real work. That makes sense. Uh, I remember the same build up leading into Headlands 100 last year, building the base, easy paces, didn't matter, you know, all that stuff. Uh, but we've talked about that on other episodes. I realized that we probably have time for maybe one or two more Ask Coach Roach questions. So oh boy, are we, we getting got? there already? We are. Uh, let's see, yeah. shall we? She's got um, a list. A, that, I do have a big list. Yeah, a big so. list. So we I, I have I to choose from. Faster too, so we can do a few more. What's that? What? I can go faster so we can do a few more questions too. <laughs> You no. got, we have a 30 minute time limit, David, and we're already <laughs> over. <laughs> uh, Amber asked, uh, David, is consistent pace important? I find that I often have to incorporate walking into my runs or can't keep a consistent pace for very long. Uh, no physiological reason that consistent pacing matters. Um, in fact, I think it's one of the great things about training for trails is that, you know, the trail kind of does it for you. But even if you're just doing pure road marathons and things like that, I mean, all that matters is, is covering the distance, being out there for a certain amount of time, altering, altering pace levels, you know, whether that's through walking or, you know, change, altering pace slightly, as long as you're not like just sprinting, as long as you're not doing like an Addy dog uh, training style, it, there's, there's no reason it would be a bad thing. So in fact, I would say, I would encourage athletes, like anything that introduces a little bit of excitement and variability into your efforts is good. Like, you know, as, as Ethan and Kim know, we'll often do surges and things like that, but it, it, it can also be at slow efforts. Like, you know, whether that's run walk or just being like, okay, I'm going to run like my, my faster, easy pace now and then slow down a little and just changing it up as you go. Awesome. A uh, question from Tim. Tim says, David, I have a 10 K race that was delayed in Houston coming up this October and I should be starting my training next week. Is it worth training despite COVID times? Oh, heck yeah. Start now. Um, get out for 10 minutes tomorrow, <laughs> least. No, I, I mean, I, I think that COVID sucks, obviously, and I'm not downplaying anyone going through anything, but it's definitely a metaphor for life as a whole in that, you know, illusion, uh, control in any, in any respect is, is an illusion and being comfortable in, with that illusion is part of being human. It's really part of growing up. It's part of like understanding that we're all going to die is like this background scream in your head. It's like, ah, this is happening, you know? Um, and with COVID, it's like extra clear and we're all sharing it at once. Um, and so I, I mean, at least with me, like I want athletes to have, not just runners, but anyone, whatever you're doing in life, to have it resilient against things you can't control. Like as long as you're, health, as long as you're healthy, like, you know, getting out and doing it, not because necessarily there's a race coming, the race is just an excuse to do what you're gonna do anyway. Um, mm-hmm. So when it, comes to, when it comes to running in this time, I'm like, yeah, I mean, if anything, this is a great time to fully examine your why and, and get out there and, and do things that might not even have a reason, right? Like, I think yeah. that's what's so magical about running is that it, it doesn't matter, right? Like, it's this totally random, weird thing that we do and might not have a broader existential purpose. Um, but in that, like, it, it gives you an ability to come to terms with your your humanity and ask questions and answer questions that, like, you don't get to do outside of maybe like a church pew. Um, not because running matters, but because running makes you confront that running doesn't matter, um, mm. which is kind of what life is, I too, I think. I think so many of us make a, a large part of our life revolve around running. I mean, as two people who do a podcast about running every week, plus videos and reviews, so so much of our life revolves around running that it's really easy to lose why we started it in the first place. And we talk about, we have this conversation quite often and uh, I think it's really easy to get caught up in, in, in just running be, being such an important part of your life that it's easy to forget sort of the why you had it in there in the first place. The love, the joy, the happiness, the mm-hmm. exploration, the adventure, the, uh, the build. The pain, the pain, the discomfort, the failure. I mean, I think that that's what's so important about this is like, you know, if the narrative of why you do anything only accounts for the very rare you know, moments of effortless transcendence or times when things flow, then you shouldn't do that thing. Like if that's running, don't do running. If that's podcasting, don't do that. If it's writing, like if you're a writer and only likes, you know, praise you get for the one out of a hundred things that resonates with people, it's like, don't be a writer, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, try to have a why that encompasses the existential crisis as crises where you don't know what why is and a lot, right alongside the joy and the fun stuff, right? Um, like, like, you know, 
I, I mean, I think about it all the time, just like you guys do. And I mean, yeah. maybe even an example. So yesterday, um, I woke up at like 3.30 a.m. on a Sunday, and I'm just like drinking my instant coffee. Like, what am I even doing, right? Like, <laughs> like even for me that does this as a living, I'm like, what am I doing right now? And, you know, I got out there. It started to make more sense. And then I, on the drive home, I type of thing I would never say outside of, no, we're not going to tell anyone. This is just us. Um, <laughs> is, you know, I, was, I was driving home and like a song came on that kind of made me reflect on everything. Not the, not the run that I just did, but just everything. And like, I actually cried in the car, you know, like while driving, like, and I've never done that before, like that open. And that's running. It's not the fact that I had a good run. It's that running gave me this emotional context where I was willing to be vulnerable in a way that I would never do in a million years otherwise. So, um, you know, I, I think when you, when you're talking about COVID, it truly sucks. And, you know, I think everyone wishes that the world wasn't in the U S wasn't in this situation, but we are. And, um, you know, now is the question. It's like, all right, let's start here. Let's move forward. I love that. And I'm really glad that we, got some of that discussion in there because I think it's yeah. also super crucially important for a lot of people right now who are trying to figure out training through this and trying to figure out goals and how to set a goal. And and also people approaching the time where like in March and April when things were getting canceled and postponed and they thought, oh, by summertime, I'll be able yeah. to race some of those races. And now we're kind of like in that time period where maybe people are thinking, oh, things are going to be normal. And now we're seeing, obviously. That's not. I'm kind of 2026, like that around <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I mean, you know, it's a joke, but also not in the, in the sense that it, there's so much uncertainty that grasping onto straws of like, I control, you know, like this thing, this, it, yeah. that's probably not mentally healthy. Even if it works short term, um, I, I have a feeling that it will backfire later as, as you know, I've seen with coaching already, you know, with people who are supposed to have races now that had gotten pushed to now, you know, so yeah, I mean it's it's an it's a cre- it's a very interesting time that we're in now. And and Megan and I were actually commenting a couple of weeks ago that it's like people are way more down than they even were at the beginning. I would say, or at least like right after the beginning. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, you know, other coaches. So we coach a lot of coaches, and they made similar comments. So if that's you, if you're feeling that feeling of like being unmoored and feeling lost or whatever, know that you there are tons of people right there with you, and there's no shame in that at all. We just yeah, were talking about I was this gonna say, We just thing. had the same conversation and have been hearing from people in our community as well. It's like, it feels like there's this big secondary or even third or fourth wave of kind of dread or anxiety or depression happening right mm-hmm. now. Uh, so I guess if anyone is watching and maybe, maybe nodding their head, just know that that's this feeling that you might be feeling right now is not yours. Like there's so many people going through the same thing. It's a very... I'm, I'm actually glad to hear David say that because I always, as I've been updating my log with David and stuff, I'm like, how, I mean, I had a bad run and I, it's not necessarily because my run was bad, but because it's because life shit is bad. And that sort of trends like transcends into the run. And, uh, but to hear that his athletes and the community at large has sort of had that sort of general feeling of like, Oh, things aren't necessarily getting better. So our runs are getting better. My life isn't getting better. It's common. It seems like it's been pretty common. This is one of the only truly shared, like fully shared experiences we'll ever see. So it's this community, it's the running community, but it's also everyone. And so one, there's a lot of comfort to be had in in opening up and talking to people about it, whether that's friends or, you know, therapists, mental health professionals Mm -hmm. or whatever, just, you know, make sure you're expressing those feelings. But two, like also understand that people feel and express those things differently. Um, So, you know, I'm thinking specifically of like, the the anti-maskers you know like the, those the people that are against like often that isn't coming from a place of like oh i want to you know whatever go against science it's coming from a place of like this sucks and i'm scared and you know that's not to say like that's 100 percent. it's like okay it's just the idea of like you know people like, what compassion looks like right now might be a little bit different than it looks in regular times even like that that openness to, to other people going through life in their, in their own, like, you know, trying to get through this crazy thing in their own way. Mm-hmm. 
Um, I'm glad to have this conversation with you, David, and I appreciate you opening up so much. Anytime you join us on the show, you always divulge just a lot of really wonderful information to our viewers and to people who have the questions and stuff. And I do, I always appreciate, well, like always so the last 50, go ahead. What I didn't specify is when I was, when I was in the car and I started crying. What with was, the song? Girls just want to have fun. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I didn't ask because I was like. It's either going to be a a, a song that's song song. pretty. It's going to be the thong song. <laughs> oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I said that because I read a tweet today saying it was like the like twenty years ago it was released. Literally I, just read that. I got like a truck. Truck. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Stop it! Don't. Don't. <laughs> uh, that song for, always brings you to tears. I, I thought it was going to be a very specific song, like uh, deep in a playlist, a, a David Roach playlist. And I was like, okay, I, you know, it's probably personal to him. So you know, I didn't want to get too deep uh, or, or pry, no, I think actually, is my thing. It, or it's it going to be was. a song like that, Girls Just Want to Have Fun. It actually was, um, you know, to be to be serious, it was Wagon Wheel, but, you know, like a, a really cliche song. But because Wagon Wheel by Old Pro Medicine so, Show, because when I read Anton's race report way back in the day, that was when we were in North Carolina and I had just gone there. And mm. so it was like bringing back like a memory of where I was when I saw that. And like, you know, just it gets back to the craziness of this whole thing we're all experiencing. And like, I guess we're probably running, running on time. So I just like to think about the final message for people listening. It's that that uncertainty that you probably feel about whatever it is you do. So like running is one of those things where I think it's pretty obvious because we all know at some level that it's just running. Um, but it also applies to, I mean, your your family, your partners, you know, what you do for work, w eating. Like, have you ever thought about just like, why am I enjoying this so much or whatever it is? Like there's this built in uncertainty into the human condition and it can be super scary, but everyone is right there along with you. So like if you're if you're able to like see that feeling and instead of being like run away from that feeling as fast as I can do whatever to escape it whether that's like buying a Porsche or you know like it's drinking or whatever it is instead of that be like lean into that feeling a little bit and be like oh, wow that's what it means like to that's what it feels like to be human and not only do I feel that way but like everyone else does too my best friend feels like that way my partner probably feels that way you know, my enemies feel that way too. And, um, the message not being to like give up on any of those things. It means to go full steam ahead at those things because, you know, you're going against uncertainty. And the one great power we have as humans is to be like, to look into that cold, dark night, put on your headlamp and just sprint straight into it. Love it. Damn it. Every show, every time <laughs> we have David on. I always love the last 15 minutes. That's what that's what I was going to say before. He then goes on to drop more mics. Uh, <laughs> David, you just you're a wordsmith. You're you're very very good at vocalizing things that so many people feel or mm -hmm. are feeling or going through, and you're able to identify that and uh, personalize it. We really really appreciate having you in our lives, but then also just having us on our show. Uh, having you you on our show. not we just we appreciate, appreciate having, having us, us on, on our, our show, show. <laughs> <laughs> can i can i say one quote by a philosopher right before i go because i think it's really applies and it's baby let me see that thong thong <laughs> thong and that's really what i want to leave you with today uh <laughs> Cisco's going to flag us. Uh, he's going to be like... This episode is definitely getting flagged. That is not your lyric uh, to use. Um, but I also want to point out that legendary trail runner Chrissy Mail is in the chat room. And she mentioned that Wagon Wheel is my favorite song to play on the guitar. The only one I can play. Hi, guys. Oh, my gosh. I need that as an Instagram story tonight, Chrissy, whenever you can. Because we all that, need that. That is amazing. Uh, David Roach is our guest tonight, uh, just one of the kindest, most generous uh, humans on earth who does so much for so many people, can go set an FKT, but set the stage for the next person to, uh, to go set it. Uh, it's never about him, and it's just it's one of his many amazing qualities. David, can you just let people know where they can listen to the podcast, where they can find out how to get in touch with you for coaching duties and stuff like that? Just uh, where can people go for that sort of stuff? Um, so right now, Some Work, All Play is the podcast name. And so you can just search that wherever you get podcasts. And then otherwise, you're loved. My email's all over the internet. 
email anything, anytime. And, um, you know, the support of both you, Ethan and Kim, and then everyone listening means so much to Megan and I. And like, you know, when I was trying to the thong song on the car on the way home, like a lot of that is just feeling, feeling that love and support. So thank you all. You got it, man. We love you very much, David Roach. Appreciate you being on the show again tonight. Uh, we're going to end tonight's Ginger Runner Live episode number 318 on that note. But we are going to move into our after show with the wonderful David Roach. We'll have him for just a couple of minutes. So as any residual questions here, we'll ask him there. But if you'd like to join us for our after show, you can go to patreon.com slash the ginger runner for as little as a dollar a month, which is a fraction of a cup of coffee, as we like to say. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can join us for our after shows. And then our daily live streams are at the $3 level and above. Um, and it'll be Daily Brew 106 six tomorrow. tomorrow. <laughs> Daily Brew 106. We've been going daily every single day since COVID started, and it's been uh, a wild journey. There's been some stories to tell, uh, so you may want to join us over there. But at the end of every show, we like to recognize a member of the community who goes above and beyond, uh, does something pretty amazing. We like to recognize our GR crew member of the week. Kim, who is this week's GR crew member? This week's GR crew member of the week is Joe Adams. And Joe says she completed her first hundred mile week. The last two days of the challenge spent in the beautiful Lake District, taking on some Uh of the Lakeland hundred route trails. And I believe Joe is in Belfast. Belfast, Lakeland District. I think that's where Joe is. Yeah. There's been a lot going on in the Fell District over there. Uh, John Kelly setting the FKT. Uh, Who just set the FKT, David? Remind me. Just this last weekend? It was Damien. A week later. <laughs> Unfortunately, they're delightful, but they're like, it's also super awkward. <laughs> uh, but it, like, it's an incredible feat, too, because I think it was a record that was that stood for 31 years. John Kelly came in and, you know, barely broke it. It was a 268 mile route or something crazy. And then Damien Hall, uh, Innovate Runner, a week later, came and said it again, uh, besting it by a couple of hours, I believe. Uh, it all happened this last week, and I'm going to try to get more info on that. Maybe we can get Damien or John on the show just to talk about it, because what an effort. Regardless, we'll see everyone in the after show. Thank you so much for tuning in to Ginger Runner Live, episode 318 tonight. We love you. We appreciate all of you, and a big thank you to our guest, David Roach. We'll see you guys next week for more. Bye. Bye. Bye.